tell you that, they take the job, and then you find out they can't do it, you're off the hook in terms of terminating them um, based on, because it was in the job description, they took the job and didn't tell you until afterwards. That's probably what I'm guessing you might be getting. If the back injury occurs afterwards, then you get into disability accommodation issues. That's a whole other lecture. Okay. Whole another day. <laughs> um, overall tips about job descriptions. Be specific, especially when you're describing essential job duties. Because again, if there's a disability issue, what the courts are going to look at is what are the essential job duties. They don't have to be able to do every single possible job duty, but the essential ones they need to be able to do. So be very specific when you really think about what do they really absolutely have to do, and if they can't do this, I might as well not hire a person. So really think through that. The other additional job duties that aren't as essential, you can kind of just quickly summarize them. Those don't need to be as detailed. Um, this is one I've seen with the economy being in the, in the toilet a little bit, is requiring only what's legitimately needed. So, I mean, yes, you may be able to get somebody with a master's degree, but if you don't need somebody with a master's degree, don't require somebody with a master's degree. Um, that seems like an easy way to sort out resumes, but it actually can get you into a, what we call an adverse impact claim. Um, any specific requirement of post-secondary education has a, an adverse impact on minority groups, so you may be unknowingly then filtering your pool before it even comes in the door and filtering out minorities and not even know it. And if you really legitimately need a master's degree, that's not a problem. But if you really don't need one and you just put it on there because then you'll get less resumes, you're, that's going to be a problem. So make sure that your requirements are really what's necessary. And then if you if you can always say master's degree preferred, something like that, if it's above and beyond what's needed. Um, lack of quality job descriptions really make it difficult to hire <laughs> the right person because the person being hired has a totally different picture in their mind of what the job is than what you have in mind. So it's important to have that. Um, it also make it more difficult for you to conduct performance evaluations, because what are you evaluating? And to discipline and terminate them, because you can say, well, you're not fulfilling this job duty, and they'd say, I never knew I had that job duty, because you never really got it written down. Um, lawful hiring is a whole day, um, so this is a very, very brief. Um, in interviewing, the important thing is to use consistent questions with everybody. Um, and take notes on their answers. Focus on their ability to do the job. I always tell people, if you're not sure if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's an okay question to ask, or if it's not an okay question, ask yourself, will this tell me if they're able to do the job? If the answer to that is no, then don't ask it, because it's really not relevant. So, um, it's okay to think about personality fit. I mean, if they're not going to work with the rest of the group, if, if, if personality-wise, then that's a legitimate thing to think about. So do. Don't just find the most technically qualified person. I see a lot of companies make that mistake and not consider the personality fit. They just get the most technically qualified person. And then the company may be in growth mode, and that person is really more of a status quo person and not a growth person. That's going to be a problem. You're going to end up firing them, or they're going to end up getting miserable and quit, which costs you money. Avoid personal information in any kind. A lot of companies do this as an icebreaker. Don't just don't even discuss age, family, ethnicity, medical history, religion. Don't do that. Hey, are you married and have kids as an icebreaker? It's just a bad idea. So avoid personal questions like that. When you're when you're making your hiring decision and making an offer, I always recommend that you have a written offer letter because this will clear up any potential misunderstandings in terms of what the pay rate was going to be. You'd be amazed how many misunderstandings there are, how many hours or what hours the person was going to work. So a written offer letter should include pay rate, title, hours, how much vacation they're going to get, if that's an issue, and their start date, um, or at least potential start date. But if you're going to do alcohol or drug screening, criminal background checks, reference checks, all of that, the offer letter needs to state that it's contingent on those clearing. You're seeing people adding social media checks to them. Social media yeah. checks? I haven't yet. There's a company out there I haven't. I have not yet run across clients who are doing that, but I think it will certainly happen. And as of right now, that's legal, but I don't necessarily recommend it because you could run into coming across personal information that you really weren't couldn't ask about, and then maybe they perceive that you made the decision based on that. So I don't recommend social media checks. That's just my personal take on it. Um, so that's what you need to know about offers. Can I just ask, back to the job description as small businesses, so we're growing and changing. What if you hire somebody on this set of job description and maybe part-time, but the job expands mm -hmm. to a new, 
How much, I mean, can you amend the job yes, description? Yes, absolutely. And at what point? Update the, well, as soon as there's going to be a change. And then you and just go back and say. I would sit down with the person and say, well, you don't usually people sign off in a job description. You just say, job's changed, here's a new job description, you still want the job. You know, assuming you want the person, I just want to make sure you understand this is the job that's changing. And they say, yep, yeah, and then you're good to go. They say, mm -hmm. then, okay, then you have a legitimate reason to, to terminate that person. The job description changed. They weren't willing to take on the new job description. Um, okay, and in terms of your hiring decisions, um, you will document, 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 document. If you learn one word from me today, it's the word document. There's a myth out there you should never write anything down. And that's generated by people who are trying to get away with breaking the law. Okay? It may, when you're trying to prove it, may be harder to prove they're breaking the law intentionally if they don't write anything down. But for most of us who are trying to comply with the law, write it down because 90 Five percent of the time, that will save your butt when he gets to court. If you have a document, a document who you're hiring and why, why you made that decision, why you thought that person was more qualified, or why you thought that person would be a better fit for the company, um, and you know, I mean, get help to create a system for that makes it easy for you to document. Make, get training on, you know, more in-depth training on lawful hiring. We do a two-hour training course for all of our clients. It's like employment law 101 in two hours. This is like the half-hour version. So we really train our clients in depth about lawful hiring practices and how to document it. So you may want to consider getting some kind of help with that, especially if you haven't done it before. All right, employee handbooks. Why do we need them? What are they? I get this question a lot. I don't need one of those. All right. The purpose is to create policies and procedures, clearly communicate expectations, consequences, and rewards to employees, and provide uh, a way for you to be consistent in enforcing your policies. Um, in several of my articles, I talk with New Business Minnesota, I talk about the fact that being an employer is a lot like being a parent. Okay, so those of you with kids can relate to this. If you have, let's say, three children and they don't have any rules or expectations or consequences, what's going to happen? They're going to get out of control. You're going to have chaos. And not because they mean to be bad, but because they don't know what's expected of them. They don't have any expectations. The same thing happens with employees. So it's important to make sure that you set those clear expectations. What, what are the consequences if you don't meet them? And what rewards are you going to get if you do? That's really important. Um, you will have less problems. So why? Okay, so those are the reasons. Those are the purposes. Why should I do this? Well, it's going to save you time because as the owner or the manager, you're not going to be making case-by-case -case decisions every day with employees. Well, can I have tomorrow off? And can I have this? And can I do that? Uh, I don't know. You're going to end up answering a lot of questions on a case-by-case -case basis, and in doing that, you're, I guarantee you, unknowingly, you're going to not be consistent, which is then going to open you up to liability. Well, how come that person got more vacation than me? And how come that person got to miss five days of work before they got fired, and I got fired after missing three? So that's where you get into trouble. Um, it will help you in terminations because you can cite which company policy they violated, which makes it very easy to process the termination. That will help you minimize unemployment claims. If you have documented that they they violated particular policy, and it will also give you a defense if that termination is a question through some kind of discrimination, harassment, retaliation charge. You have this. Well, no, nope, they violated the attendance policy. It's clearly laid out in the handbook, and they missed more than five days, and that was our policy. Oh, all right, case closed. So, tips about employee handbooks. The policy should be well thought out, specific, and 100% clear. I do not believe in. Um, boilerplate, one-size-fits-all handbooks, they're generally drafted for large companies. They do not work for small businesses. Every single one of our clients' employee handbooks looks completely different because they're all 100% customized. It's important to customize it to meet the needs and the culture of your company. If you have a very formal company, your dress code is going to look different than somebody who works at a social media company. And if you buy a handbook with a one-size-fits-all dress code, it's not going to work for you. So that's really important. It needs to be easy for employees to read and understand. So, you know, it needs to make sense to the average person, needs to be able to comprehend it. So, in a way, you have to, you know, they always say, what, write down to a fifth grade level or whatever. I mean, that's kind of what you need to do. It needs to be relatively short. I see companies with 30, 35 page handbooks. I see nobody's ever going to read that. 10 to 15 pages is about average for most of our clients. Um, include information on the company's history and values. Um, so that you're communicating that information to the employees. Set up a system for yourself to enforce the policies, for instance, tracking, vacation, attendance, PTO, whatever it is, make sure you have a system. Um, 